experts would corroborate this, that no demons can stand those words. There is another benefit of those words. While we are doing meditation, we try to contemplate that we are seeing, seeing some forms. Sometimes we think we are seeing the form of the master. That itself may be a negative power. Maybe the devil creating that form to mislead us. How do we take care of that? How do we take the negative devil creating the form of God or master and saying, here I am out to help you. Let's go out to Las Vegas. <laughs> That's where all the truth is residing now. I'll help you in the slot machines. I am your master. Do what I tell you. How do we handle this? If you are doing your meditation under the guidance of a master, you will repeat the words and that form will disappear and talk nothing. Try it out. It always works. It's such a strong power. Therefore, you have to have this built-in device inside even to test out if the form in front of you in meditation is the master himself or not. So even master has to be checked out before you can really proceed to say, master is giving me information inside. Master is guiding me inside. You must check out. It's not the devil playing the master. You must check out. It's not the devil playing God. This special precaution has been taken by perfect living masters all the time. And we as followers of that path must take the precaution and never do meditation on our own thinking, oh, this is only a question of going within. What's the problem? We sit in meditation and then we all those different signs and there's different faces that come to us. We will find out who is who and be guided. There's too much mischief going on in the negative world. So we should avoid that. Now, I'd like to ask you if you have any questions on what I said earlier and now. Then we proceed with the next session of going within. Yes. But that a negative energy will never be able to properly reproduce the portion. That's right. That's one of the precautions. The, <clears throat> the mantra is one of them. The second is that masters have taken a physical form, but the energy of the higher consciousness is so strong that this portion, the forehead and the eyes of the master cannot be replicated by the negative power. You can always test it out. If you look at the face of the master, you will see the rest of the face. This will be very unclear. So you know it's a mind making it up. If this portion comes up clearly, you can try, uh, trust it. It's not possible for the negative force to make this portion of the physical form. Yes? If you try to heal people psychically or um, spiritually, how does that work in coordination with their karma? Does it do any good? Are you wasting your time? <clears throat> what about that? If you do psychic healing, you are transferring part of the karma to yourself. I have attended some workshops of healers, in fact many of them, organized in this country. I have not found too many healers in good health. The healers themselves who are using psychic powers to heal are themselves in a bad state because they are taking on the karma. This is psychic healing. It is different from spiritual healing, which is healing with love. When you heal with love, it's like identifying with the person and praying together. You don't have to pass your psychic energy to that person to draw the karma out. Spiritual love with healing is totally different and does not cause any negative effect on you. But healing with psychic powers or energies is different and causes you to take on the karma of the other person. Should be avoided. It can help. Yes, healing with love always helps. Healing with love helps the person you are helping and helps you also. Healing with psychic powers may or may not help the other person. It certainly doesn't help you. Yes. Yes. When you mentioned destiny uh, and being created, and you were going to use the word destiny and karma interchangeably so that they're the same thing or, or you study something different? I was using the word destiny in terms of pralab, the karma created by which we are here. Not karaman or senchit. I was talking of pralab. To all the karma being created in the, in the mind, the thoughts. All the karma is created with the thoughts. Anyway, that's karaman. Karaman is the new karma we are creating. All the karma we create is in the mind. It's not necessary to commit a theft physically in order to create karma. To think about committing a theft creates the karma. It's a thought. And if you commit a theft without knowing anything about it, there is no karma. 
karma is in the mind. And so long as the mental action is complete, you have created karma. But that is the pralab, that is the karaman karma, the new destiny you are creating. I was not talking of that. When I use the word destiny, I mean pralab karma. That means the karma with which we have come into this world and we have to pay off that karma. Pralabha is in every form. But creation of karma, karaman, is only in the human form. Only human form can create new karma. Yes. With over the years of lectures, we determined that karma is not like God making judgments about whether an action is good or bad, and we are going to that at all one time. Yes. And God, make, God makes no judgments. We're getting down to a point where it sounds like you're saying that karma is like sort of a zero-sum energy transfer paradox or paradigm of some kind. And I noticed that in the new literature, they're trying to get rid of the, the, the myths of demons and all these uh, anthropomorphic things and reduce the language to energy terms. And as you were talking about uh, how the master plays into stop a negative energy from developing, uh, would it be more advantageous to think of uh, the master or that the master would represent kind of energy that dispels or makes up a negative energy pattern. I mean, is this new whole effort to try to explain the spiritual religious paradigm in quantum physics? These are two, two different questions really built into one. Let me address both of them. The question is whether we are just changing the tautological, the euphemisms for these uh, phenomena from angels, demons and all that into more modern uh, quantum physics theories of the negative numbers and positive numbers. Are we just changing the language or are we also changing the substance of this? And the first thing is, yes, we are changing the language. The powers, the negative and positive power, powers remain the same. The caveman did not know physics to this extent, so he didn't use these numbers. So he used the old language. He was afraid of it. He, he dealt with monsters. Now we call them shadows. He dealt with monsters in his cave. He had to fight with the fear of getting up and getting out of the cave without being followed by a monster. And the monster was his own shadow. We don't fight that anymore. I've never seen anybody fighting his or her shadow anymore. they given up that. So the difference in fear created by something unreal, which is still prevalent today. For example, the doubt and fear about another person is as much a shadow as the shadow in the cave for the caveman. We have left the shadow of the caveman behind, but the fear the other person is going to hurt me is still the same. It's still a shadow. And we are now fighting this shadow. But therefore, this is a change mostly in the, in the development of physics and science and technology, we have come to a point where we deal contemporaneously with these terms. The second thing is that not only has this changed in terms of the language we use, which will keep on changing in the next century, they'll have given up, they'll wonder that we talked of negative forces and so on. Where was the space-time continuum they talked about? It was an old illusion. So they'll start developing new theories of energy. The second thing is, is there a real shift taking place? The real shift that is taking place over the centuries is that we took it for granted that religion and spirituality was one extreme of the belief system and science and technology and empirical evidence was the other extreme. That those are separate things. Either you can be a believer in the church or you can go to a lab and work your science. What's happening now is they are coming closer. They come so close that you, can, you could be really working on God in a lab in the future without any contradiction. But that's a change in substance because our science and technology has not been able to stay in the crucible and in the lab. Science and technology has jumped out into forms of energy which it cannot explain in physical terms. The fact that we have to take a substance like charcoal to understand diamond was old physics. The fact that we have to take a substance like time and understand how it's being created by matter is a new substance altogether. Old physicists and scientists never had to deal with the substance. New ones have to today 
and we'll have to deal with it even more in the years to come. When they deal with the nature of time and how to handle it, what effect it has on matter as we can see it, they'll be coming so close to the other group that was all the time saying time is Karl, time is a negative force, it's creating, it's drowning our positive positiveness, positive energy. And at some point they'll be so close that some some thinking people, some people who want to merge these, like Joyce Dofty, will jump over the bridge and say, oh, it means the same thing. This is the change in substance. Now I want to refer to one word you used, energy. It's very commonly used in this country, particularly. Western culture generally, and the United States of America particularly, wants to equate energy with consciousness. They say, my being was filled with the energy of love. Have you heard that expression? Anybody heard this? That there can be a being filled with energy of love. According to our Eastern definitions of these words, love has no energy. Energy is a very low form of expression. You can have energy of passion, anger, lust. You can have attachments. You can have greed. All these are energies. But love is a spiritual experience way above the energy of a human being. There's a difference of definition. But you're not using the word energy in that sense. If you use the word energy as, a, as representing the things that happen to human consciousness when fully trapped in the body, then it's right. Everything that is happening in the human body, in the human body is energy. We think we are in love, it's all emotion. It's energy. All emotions are energy. But when we talk of the spiritual experience of love, where you forget yourself and get so identified with the beloved, you think you are the beloved. That's not energy. That's love per se, which is no energy. It's a state of consciousness. It's a state of consciousness above the mind. Even mental energy is put as a question mark if you can use the word energy. You can call it mental awareness, mental consciousness. So these words have been used with different definitions. So if we don't distinguish between them, we can call the higher experiences all experiences of energy. Whereas the energy should be understood to be the product of the work in the six chakras in the body, which are all controlling the energy fields of the human life as it is trapped in this body. There is no energy field that is available to us if we are in the higher spiritual regions freed from this bondage. When you are freed from this time and space bondage, there is no energy, but there is love, knowledge, intuition, bliss, joy, all that is there. But energy is missing. So we use the word energy only in relation to the chakras of the human body. So I just wanted to clarify in what sense I use the word energy. Only in relation to the chakras of the body. Above that is consciousness, awareness without the need of energy. Now what's the difference really? Is there a readily identifiable difference? Readily identifiable difference is energy is hot. Makes you hot. And Pure love consciousness makes you cool. Though people here with a lot of energy say he plays cool. But that's just a, a use of language. There's a misuse of the word cool. That fellow is cool. I mean, this is, there's a hot use of the word cool. <laughs> energy, energy tries to express itself in a form which can be related to the basic physical and astral and sub-astral activities. When you go to spiritual activities, there's so much peace, so much tranquility. You would say all energy has subsided in order to have that tranquility. It's so cool, so peaceful there. So this is one of the distinctions and we would use the word energy for the more volatile, volatile activities of the human emotions on the physical plane. The rest is a higher level of awareness which defies these definitions of energy. Yes. From since I was a kid, I have this feeling that this of God. When this feeling comes, I can feel this energy just flow right through the like water. And I would know things. And people think I was crazy. I couldn't fit in with society. And something telling me to find the truth. And I was seeking for the truth for 40 years. I searched in the military, everywhere I tried to find the truth. 
just recently I decided, I come to the conclusion that the, the fruit is within me. But an incident happened that um, I think somewhere about 17, 18 years ago, um, when I was 17, 18, that my sister, mother-in-law, was sick in bed for two weeks. She see the doctor and everything. She couldn't get up from the bed with fever. And, and while I was sitting there, I had this intuitive feeling of something. I asked her, did you pray to God? She said, yes. And I said, but how about we pray together? And I walked over and I hold her hand. And while we were saying the Lord's Prayer, I feel this energy has come down. Or a movement like water coming through. And by the time we finish pray, say the prayer, she get up in her bed and she said, everything is okay, everything is gone. And I constantly feel that. I've read many books concerning Eastern and Western now. And I find there's one common thing that truth is real, that is. The rest is unreal. And I read about uh, in the Gita where Krishna was having a discussion with Arjuna. And he was telling that for controlling the mind and the senses. And he said, he was asking this question, he said, well, how can I see you in your divine self? He said, you cannot see it in, my, in your gross eyes, but you can see it through our spiritual eyes. And as he's saying that, I, I find that, um, that he said that when he looked in that direction, he saw him. He saw him as a beginning, the middle, and the end. But he saw him everywhere. He had no beginning, no middle, no end. And he was saying that um, those who worship the demigod worship me. Those who worship the devas and deities and what say for worship me. But they don't know my true self. But he said, those who worship me know my true self. My spirit dwells within them. And they are my very self. Now how does this, in a multitude of beings, know the true self that transcends Parabrahma? To continue your statement, Lord Krishna speaking to Arjun on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, as recorded in the Gita, says, Krishna, do battle. You are on the battlefront. Kill these people. That's your duty. Arjun says, are you familiar with the Gita? Anybody familiar with the Gita? You Okay, some of you are familiar. Let me put it this way, to give you a very brief introduction. The Gita is one of the most uh, publicized book from the East. And it is the dialogue between Krishna and Arjun. Arjun was one of the five princes who ruled the state and at some time the five cousins who were the Kauravs, the Pandavas and the Kauravs had to battle with each other. They fought over territory. And this is about the battle scene where the chariot driver, like a chauffeur, the chauffeur of the limousine of those days, the limousine chauffeur of the prince Arjun, whose name was Krishna, who was spiritually far more, far more advanced than the, the owner of the limousine, there is a conversation taking place between them. The conversation was not witnessed by anybody. Arjun never noted it down and Krishna never said keep a record of it on a tape recorder. There was nothing done. This was witnessed by another person called Sanjay, who was telling a blind king Dhritarashtra. The king was sitting there, he says, Sanjay, using your inner eye, tell me what is now happening on the battlefield. So what Sanjay told Dhritarashtra, the blind king, came to be recorded. He could only see with his telepathic eyes. Nobody went to the battlefield to check it out. But we consider that part as not of great consequence that Sanjay, through his inner eyes, saw this experience and got it recorded for the benefit of the king. But what he saw and told is this, that Arjun wants to know, why are we fighting? Krishna, you are the enlightened one. 
You are the one who knows. The knower of all things. Why are you driving my chariot into battle? And why are you making me fight with these people? And Krishna says, this is karma. You have to fight them. Arjun says, when I try to fight them and kill them, I see my uncles and my relatives, my cousins, they are all on the other side. How can I kill them? And Krishna says, it is your duty to kill them. He says, I can't believe that an enlightened person can tell me that I should kill people. Then Arjun is given a Virat Roop. Virat Roop means that form of Krishna in which he opened his mouth and showed him his astral being. And he saw in that wide open mouth of Krishna for a moment, he saw all those cousins and all those uncles already chewed up and eaten and dead. And he says, Krishna, I am mortified. I am frightened. Please close your mouth. I can't see you anymore. He says, Arjun, this is the mistake we make. When we do our duties in this world, we think we are doing something new. Duty is an opportunity to do something that has already happened. We don't do anything new. We are doing that which has already happened. And yet, not knowing what has happened, it becomes duty. And we become yogis. And we become the enlightened ones. Very new kind of concept Krishna gave him. That you can, by doing action, not with regard to the consequence, but only action, for the sake of action as duty, you can become an enlightened one. So he said, Yoga karma saukaushalam in Sanskrit it's written. What is true yoga? Yoga is skillful action without regard to the reward thereof. Hence came the whole theory of karma yogi, that you can become a karma yogi by doing actions selflessly. Actions without regard to reward, actions only as duty. A person who can act in his life only as duty, without regard to any consequences, becomes a yogi and becomes the enlightened one. Then Arjun says, this is a terrible way to kill people and become a good yogi. Is there no other way? And Krishna says, of course, there are three ways to become a yogi. I only told you about one. The way I told you how to become a yogi is by selfless action, action unrelated to the consequences. Such a yogi is called karma yogi. The second is called jnana yogi or sankhya yogi. A yogi who gets his knowledge by intellectual knowledge. He gathers the intellectual knowledge. He finds the limitation of his own self. He finds that there is nothing else true, that all things have already happened. He assimilates this knowledge. And by getting this gyan, this knowledge, he comes to know he has no power. He has to go through life as ordained. He accepts the will of the Krishna, of the one who knows. And by doing that, he becomes a gyan yogi. Is, it, is there any other way? He says, yes. There is a third one called bhakti yogi. You can do bhakti yoga. That means yoga of love and devotion. When you do yoga of love and devotion, you forget yourself. You are so immersed in the beloved. That that merging with the beloved, your identification with the beloved, makes you cease to exist. And whatever you do is for the beloved. And then you become a yogi. And then Arjun says, Krishna, you have taught me three kinds of yoga. Do all these three kinds of yoga lead to the same kind of ultimate escape from the misery and pain of this world. Krishna says, I have not given you three fine kinds of yoga. I have given you three aspects of the same yoga. You became a karma yoga. You became a yogi who accepted. When I told you about gyan yoga, I told you about yoga that accepts. When I told you about bhakti yoga, I told you about a yoga that accepts. All three are really yogas of acceptance. When you accept me, the enlightened one, when you accept the enlightened one, you become the enlightened one. So this is a very powerful discourse and people are reading it. It's large. There are some chapters which tell about the worldly deeds, duties to be performed, some chapters about bhakti, some chapters about knowledge. All those end up in the final discourse where he says, all that I have given you, Arjun, Krishna says, is within the three gunas, within the three aspects of creation. 
they are within the aspects of prakriti that means nature nature and matter have combined to create these scenes about which i spoke but there is a truth which those who come to me through the higher form of the word they attain which is beyond the three gunas so if you come through the route of the naam of the shabad you go even beyond that the gita is very subtle references to the power of the word taking you above the uh, above the yoga that unites you with these different levels of consciousness the power of god that flows can flow from any level and flows through us the power of god that flows through us affects people if the power of god is flowing through your being and you keep your mouth shut and don't say a word and just are you are in the presence of people the people are affected by you that power is so strong so you can call it power you can call it energy truthfully the word energy would be substituted by the word power only depending on the level of consciousness that you talk of the yogis who have experienced that power were able to influence people people from childhood have had that experience he is a lucky young man who in 40 years has been able to find that power same power within and when he wants to fit in this power is what we are talking about he is associating it with his own experiences but his experience is not limited this is the beginning you know that this is the beginning not the end because this is the beginning of finding out what you set out to find so all this has been a big help to you help you more okay are we ready now for this one more question there Mm-hmm. Yes, I am no master. Do I look like one? I am a talkative parrot. <laughs> <laughs> But you will get a mantra from a living master. Don't worry about. Well, I do know because I do consider that there is a possibility. Uh, I mean, we're talking about the demons of Munchen. It's like frankly, it did kind of scare me. So if you don't have a mantra, are you suggesting that maybe we don't meditate? No, I am not suggesting that you don't meditate. I am suggesting meditate carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out <laughs> and wait for the mantra. What else can one do? If one finds out that the benefit of a mantra is so great, it can drive the demons out, can make our journey safe. You would wait for the mantra. It's worth waiting for. Just wait for it. Patience is very necessary on the spiritual path, as you must have discovered. Okay. Yes. Before there are people, uh, therapists now working on spirit releasement therapy. A few of, of uh, whom I know what their you know what their work is, and they've been rather successful. At people that uh, apparently pick up discarnate. entities that we normally refer to as earthbound because they don't know they're locked into their karmic thing and they don't move on to a higher level and they'll hang around people sometimes uh, they do it uh, you know like say a, a relative might hang around because they don't know what else to do and they'll try and guide the life of some person their nephew or niece or daughter or whatever uh but there are some of them that uh, are filled with jealousy or rage or whatever and they're trying to work that out in some way. Uh some of these therapists have been very very successful. Uh, and this ties into multiple personality because in some cases of multiple personality it would appear that it is actually spirit attachment and in another cases it might be a splitting of the ego in some way. Uh I was wondering if you uh could explain like Some of these therapists are merely talking. They hypnotize the person, or they get them in a completely relaxed state. They merely talk to the entity and try and explain to them how they can move on to, let's say, the white light. And in a lot of cases, it works. In some cases, it doesn't. Um, I wonder if you could get into that a little bit, and also mention. You, I've heard you say that for several years, you talk about the sub-astral plane. Are you really talking about? people that die and pass over they're held down at a rather low level and they have quite a bit of their like their etheric matter uh 
still clings to their astral body so that they have a certain amount of energy and some of them become maybe poltergeists or they can they can create hauntings and things like that. Yes, I'll uh, touch briefly with the subject because that is not really my forte. You know, I don't do the therapy to help these uh, uh, disembodied spirits to move on. They go by their karma. But I do want to help those to whom they are clinging. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when I use the word sub-astral, I refer to what you call still grounded. That these entities were still grounded, which means earthbound. Those who are earthbound and have still some karma left to de deal with here, with the situations here, those are in the sub-astral region. I call them sub-astral because the astral is released from the physical and is above the physical and is separate and is the and is the original copy of all events and all things that happen here. The originals can be found there. The duplicates are in the physical plane. But these people in the sub-astral region are still dealing with the copies and the duplicates. They are not going to the original. So we call them sub-astral. Sub-astral can refer to not only this physical universe, some other universes of equal level, where the degree of awareness is still almost the same as we have during embodiment, during sitting in a physical body. That's a sub-astral. These people who cling on to the physical and are earthbound are in the sub-astral region. They are not in the astral. They are there primarily because of their attachments and unfinished karma with people around them. So they will come and haunt those people, be around them, and the best therapists to get to give them release are those people themselves to whom they are clinging. They should let them go. It is the attachment of the people who are here which brings them back again and again. Very often you will find it is not the disembodied spirit that wants to cling on. It is the person they are clinging to who cannot get rid of that person. We don't release these people. That's why they cling on. It's not that we want them to go, they still cling on. The multiple personalities are also created because we want to cling on. What the psychological therapists have been able to find out is in their psychological clinics that given recession into their subconscious, they can pull out the memories of a time when they were related to those people. As the memories come back, they are able to find out the segments of individual events which are now affecting the attachment between those people and are leading to this clinging on business. That this happened when they were embodied. Excuse me, but are you saying then that I know and, and I, you know, I've read hundreds and hundreds of cases and in some cases a relative or several might be hanging around someone mm -hmm. uh, that are living. But in other cases uh, the therapist they can't find out where there's any connection. Are you saying that if, if it's a stranger that's possessing or obsessing someone in that way, are you saying that the stranger probably has karmic ties? Or exactly. I was going to proceed and saying the therapists have one limitation. They have been trained. The modern psychiatric therapist, the modern clinical psychologist has a limitation. This psychologist has been trained to believe there are no entities. This all in the mind is created from the subconscious. Therefore, all must come from childhood and the childhood began at birth and ended up to age so and so. It's a big limitation. But when they actually do work, they have a problem. When they actually do work and you proceed with the recession, the person goes back, the subject goes back. Yeah, I remember when I was 10 years old, I did this. Now I remember when I was 5 years old, recession is going on. And when it's 1 year old, the child says, now I was a child, but I remember I told my son. How could a 1 year old child tell his son? This is coming in the same session. The same session of recession is suddenly taking the reverse trend in age, going backwards to childhood, back to an old age. How can that happen? I held in 1971 a workshop of clinical psychologists in Michigan. And that was the, attended by about 50 psychologists and psychiatrists, practicing psychiatrists. And they all had their cases to share with me. And they all came up with this strange phenomenon that when they were giving recession in memory into the subconscious to find out what was hidden there, after a while the subject went way back, way beyond their date of birth and they could not then describe it as anything but fantasy. 
They said, there's a capacity for fantasizing. The rest was fine. It was memory. When it came to going beyond this life, it was fantasy. Why? Because there was a block in the therapist. He could not believe in reincarnation. He could not believe in previous lives. When the therapist cannot believe, he has to give a new definition to what is happening. But those open-minded therapists who themselves said, we will not judge except from the empirical evidence coming before us. They went back and were able to trace back the relatives of the past lives still clinging on, giving an answer to your question. So it is actually the unfinished business, if you might call karma, the unfinished business of these that is making them cling on. And a much larger role can be played by the subject than by the therapist. Instead of therapist addressing those unseen beings, it is better to encourage the subject to address those unseen beings and let them go, be released. It will work much better. Yes. Can mantra uh, only be used inside? Is there mantra for external demons? Oh, yes. The mantra is good for internal and external demons. But some monsters are terrible. You know, you can't deal with them, such as a boss. A husband, a wife, or children, you know. But otherwise, it works fine. So, how would you say your mantra if you were encountering a situation such as in your know, personal relationship with your boss, whatever, you wouldn't stop and do your mantra then? Or how would you, do you do it constantly. And the boss says, Oh, you're doing fine today. You say, What's happened to you, boss? It works all the time. The power of the mantra is unimaginable. One day I'll talk to you about it. Remind me in some session, in some lecture, and talk to you in the power of the mantra and how to use it in this life. It's a big subject. Okay, now, yes, some more questions. Okay, is it the mantra or is it the master? The master, the mantra is the master. He's put his power into something that we readily understand. Otherwise, we don't know how to access the master. It is almost like an access code on the computer. You punch the code, it's the power is the master, not the code. The code is a device to draw the energy of the master in. So, do you just need to think of the mantra or can you think of the master in relation to the mantra? It works both ways. It works both ways. Yes. Every time I've heard you, you say, go within. And to me, it's kind of contradictory to... I'm kind of refuting your advice in a way by attending this here, in a way. I'm going without. I'm going somewhere. <laughs> That's a tough one for me. Now tell me, when I, I myself say, go within, don't run to workshops and lectures and all that. Don't I say that? When I say that, do you take me literally? But you still come back. It's a contradiction. Are you listening to, which part of my talk are you listening to? When I say, go within, that's the truth. Don't run after lectures, seminars, workshops. I, of course, say, including mine. Don't I say that? I don't say, only mine are right. Go to my workshops and not. I say, don't go to any workshop. Go within. Then why should you come to a workshop? That's a dilemma. Is that right? Yeah. That is a dilemma. If I am faced by the same dilemma she is faced with, that uh, uh, I, I go to a person I trust and I want to hear the words and that person says, go within. Don't come and listen to lectures. I'll run and say, I'm not going to go back. Boy, how do I go within? I go back. You didn't tell me how to go within. Okay, do this. Okay, thanks. I go back. Now I'm going to do it. It doesn't work. What did you say I should do? Although I'm following the advice, I'm still going back and forth. Isn't that what's happening? Yeah. <laughs> That's what happens with us. We are not coming back and forth to go out. We are coming back and forth to know the techniques to improve our methods, to refine how to go within. The goal doesn't change. The goal still is go within. There's no other place to get knowledge into. You can come to any number of workshops. The workshop does not give you the knowledge and the truth. What is said in the workshop? How to go within? Practicing that gives you the technique of going within. That gives you knowledge and truth. Knowledge and truth remains inside. Go to the lectures only to the extent of learning how to go within. Otherwise, it's a waste of time.
first technique is to imagine you are there. If you can imagine you are there, imagine you are there, the more you are concentrating on your attention on being there. It's so obvious. It's common sense. That if you imagine you are there, supposing I said, imagine you are standing in the corner of this room. The more you look at the corner and feel you are there, the more of your attention is going there. It's common. It's just common sense. In the same way, if you imagine you are behind the eyes, the process of imagining you are there, I am there, I can imagine I am there, I can feel I am there. This is an imaginative process. While you are imagining, your attention is being drawn right to the third eye center and it helps. But this imagination is not a physical exercise. How many of you can imagine you are standing in this corner? Please raise your hands. Could you imagine you are standing in the corner? How many of you got strained and tired by doing that? Why? It was easy. You didn't have to flex your muscles or anything. But when I say imagine you are behind the eyes, you put all the strain on the eyes. You put your strain on the head. You put a strain on your forehead. I notice it. I see it. You are trying to do something like that. I am not saying put your physical energy behind the eyes. I am saying imagine you are there. Exactly as I said, imagine you are standing in the corner. Let's make it simple. Put your hand up like this. Flat. Good, nice seat you make. Made for yourself. Can you see it? Nice. Take it off so you can't see it. Now imagine you are sitting on the palm of your hand. Can you imagine? Can you imagine you are sitting on the palm of the hand? Any strain on your hand? Any weight on your hand? Bring it down slowly. Close your eyes and slip inside. It's all imagination. But it helps. I am telling for those people who have had difficulty imagining they are there, these are the devices. There is no strain, no stress, no energy being taken. It's pure consciousness. It's only the awareness that you are there. What is needed is that the that you are there, that, that awareness, that healing has to come. I want to emphasize that if you want to really have successful meditation, that means successfully seeing yourself or knowing yourself or going to higher regions, this starting point is very important. If you don't do this part of the exercise successfully and start doing the rest of it, it doesn't work. That's why it's important. You can do any kind of meditation, but start from there. It will work. But if you don't settle there, you are always in the physical body. Your consciousness is constantly in the physical domain. You can't have experiences of the astral and causal. Therefore, when you settle there, you disengage yourself from the physical process. And that's the starting point for good meditation. So it's important. One of the things that distracts us during this exercise of being behind the eyes is the thinking process, the thoughts that come and take us away. We forget where we are. Is that true? How many had the uh, problem with thoughts taking you away? To deal with this problem, we are now going to use the mantra as a mechanical device, not the magical powers I was talking of earlier, as a mechanical device to substitute the mantra for thoughts. Instead of thinking, think about the mantra. Instead of letting other words go into the mind, pump in these words. Pump in so much. Cover up the whole territory with these artificially <coughs> picked up words, the mantra. Cover it up so strongly, so thoroughly, there is no scope left for any other hot words to come in. And that will help you to get to the third eye center. This kind of mantra has to be used in a very specific fashion. And I'll tell you that. The mantra must be heard by you. If you don't hear the mantra, it does not help. Uh, let me illustrate. Supposing the mantra is, say, abracadabra. Just taking an example. You can say, abracadabra, abracadabra. I can keep on saying, abracadabra, and say, now when am I going to finish, abracadabra? What about that water, abracadabra? I can keep on saying, abracadabra, mechanically, physically, with my mind or tongue, and keep on thinking of a host of other things. How can I center myself? 
But if I switch over and say, I don't want to think of anything else, what have I been saying all this while? What was I saying? Abracadabra? What was I saying? And I listen to what I am saying. It's the listening part. When we listen intently to what we are saying, that attention is gathering behind the eyes. Mantra is successful if you intently listen to it, not how quickly or rapidly you say it out. Let me give you a distinction. The mind is a device that speaks in our head. The soul listens. Always. Whenever we want to speak, whether outside or in the head, we use our mind. Because we have no other speaking, uh, speaking device. Whenever we listen and receive, it's the soul, the spirit. When you want to gather your attention to your own spiritual self, you must listen and not speak. Mantra should be left to be spoken by a mind like a computer. Repetitively it goes on saying it and you sit in the center listening to what the mind is saying. Listening to the voice of the mind. Listening to any other voice it takes. If during the course of your mantra, you find some other picture comes in, some relative comes in, some loved one comes in, some dead one comes in, somebody comes in who distracts you and you are busy saying your mantra and somebody else is trying to draw your attention, don't push that somebody away. Ask that somebody to say the mantra and let the voice of that other person also say mantra. If 10 come, let 10 say the mantra. If 100 come, let 100 say the mantra. If there is an orchestra of mantra, let them all say it in unison. Nothing should be left in the head except the mantra by whatever being, whatever imagination comes in. Then you will pull your attention much more rapidly. Don't make it like a parrot-like repetition. Make it a device for concentrating your attention at the third eye center. Now, use the imagination coupled with this mantra in order to stay at the third eye center and be within. And that device is the most beautiful part of the spiritual path. The most beautiful. That is called love and devotion. You heard of that? Love and devotion. That's a great quality of the spirit. Mind cannot create it. Mind cannot replicate it. It is only in the human soul, in the human spirit and consciousness per se, that love arises. What is love? Love is the ability of consciousness to identify with another. Love is the ability by which we are so attracted, so much a part of the beloved, that we forget who we are and the self and the beloved becomes one. Have you had, had that feeling? That you were so much in love with somebody, you forgot who you were and only thought of the beloved, that was love. If it was anything less than that, and you said, I love you so much, why don't you? That's attachment. So we use the word love. If you are conscious of I and you in that great ego game of I love you, do you love me? That's attachment. In true love, spiritual love, you forget who you are. The beloved takes the place. This is a special quality of the experience of love that the beloved by identification can take the place of the self. And we use it in meditation. Because we are trying to reach the self and if the repetition of words have not been enough, if merely imagination has not worked, then we go on to the third stage of contemplation of the beloved. The one we love, the one without whom we have no personal being. And that face, that beloved, we put in front of us and absorb it and think so much with love and devotion about that being. Most of us do it for our master. The master has given us love. Nothing like There's nothing like it. So we picture the master and we get that mode of love and devotion in such a way that we are attracted to our real self in the form of the master or the beloved. Those of you who don't have a master can think of any beloved. If you don't have a beloved, coin one. Make up one for the time being. Just pretend there is one. And use that face. And express your love and devotion from the third eye center. Don't move. Remain behind the eyes in the center and express your love, your devotion. In any way you like. 
express it within. If you find that this doesn't hold you, if you move from the center, get back to mantra. If it works and that image comes back, hold on to the image. It should not be your image, but the image of the beloved. The image of the beloved in front of you will hold you. If the love is strong, it will hold you back at the third eye center. A meeting with the beloved, two hours pass like ten minutes. And when you have to attend a business meeting which you don't want to attend, you say two hours have passed, it's only ten minutes. So this is such a subjective time. Time is very subjective depending upon how much we are enjoying it. So is it true about meditation. And time flies differently at different times. Any problem with what we've been doing? Any misunderstanding? Would you like to ask any questions now? Because you have to practice this later on. Carry something with you back home. And go within. Don't come back unless you want to know more about how to go within. Otherwise, there's no sense in going, coming again and again. But I want to tell you one story. When you asked me the question, I was reminded of it. One man, an intellectual, he was a barrister. Barrister means an attorney. Practicing the bar. In England, they call them barristers. You don't have any barristers in this country. Is that true? <laughs> okay. There was an attorney. Very intellectual type. Who came to the great master. And he said, great master, I don't want to waste my time. I want to know what's the method. And I want to go in and do my job. I don't want to just, like these blind sheep outside your house. All these people flocking to you. Oh, we are out for darshan. We are out to see the master. I don't want to be one of them. Tell me the way. I want to go home, do my homework, and be done with it. Great master said, you are the first serious student I have had in a long time. Very great. Okay, I'll tell you the method. If you have any questions about it, you come back. Otherwise, don't come back. Go back and do your meditation. Don't come to me unless you have a problem. He said, fair enough. The attorney got initiated, practiced. And he said, okay, I'll go home now and do the rest. He went home, he practiced, he had a harder time. He felt that there was some difference in the quality of meditation. When he was with the master, it seemed to work a little better. At home, it wasn't that good. He couldn't understand it. Anyway, he said maybe he needs a better environment. He set up a separate cave in his house and would get into it, made it soundproof to avoid distraction and then went back to the great master only for questions. The great master answered his questions and said, don't come back. Go and do your homework. The attorney went back, went into his cave and got all the nice experiences. He came back to great master. I have one more question. I have a little problem in that area. The master clarified that. He said, go back, need not come back again. You should go inside, go within. He went back into his cave and had all the most beautiful experiences. And then he went back to great master. The master said, any more questions? He said, no master. He said, did you go within? Of course, it was so beautiful. Then why have you come back here? I did my job. He said, master, in the process I fell in love with you. I came for that, I couldn't help so what can you do? If in the process you fall in love with the master, many of us are afflicted by that bug too. <laughs> that even when we get something, we like the master so much we want to go back. This occurred to me when you asked that question. Otherwise, if it is a mechanical thing, it's not necessary to go back to a master. You just get the message, get the technique, come back. If there's a problem, go back. But in the process, a relationship comes up which is so spiritual. It's a kind of love I didn't believe till it happened with me that it exists. I did not believe that there can be a kind of love between people that is so overwhelming, so fulfilling, so unconditional that you don't have to ask any questions about it. I didn't know. The most unconditional love I ever experienced was with a spiritual teacher, a master. I couldn't get that anywhere else in the world except with people who were also drenched with the same love. And I saw they radiated the same way. And this is something totally different from the kind of relationships we constantly have calling it love. So any one of you seen the difference? Any of you experienced that spiritual love which I am talking about? If you have, raise your hands. Oh, there are many of you here. Thank you for being my co-sharers in this great experience.
It's a beautiful experience. That is what actually happens. Eventually, through the spiritual experience, we get into a spiritual state of love which is overwhelming. And we, we like the experience, but we like this even more. Sometimes we don't know which one we like more. And so this goes on. That's a spiritual way of life. Eventually, the more enlightened the person gets, the more full of love for people generally that person becomes. You will find these enlightened people so full of compassion and love. You go to them as a stranger and you see them talk to you with so much love. Where is it coming from? It's coming from the same enlightenment. It's coming from the same source which is full of love. And as we associate with them, we become full of love. And when we deal with people, we deal in a strange way. People are affected. They say, how can this be so loving? And the rest of the world is angry and mad. Especially the contrast stands out. The world, we see so much anger and madness. In the midst of it, the spiritual path creates so much love and joy for all of us. I am very happy that I was able to spend time with you on this one day workshop. I hope you will carry something worthwhile from this workshop. Those who thought that their time was well spent and was worthwhile, please raise your hands. So I know the success rate of the workshop. Good. Those who thought they wasted their time. Thank you for being courteous. I know some of you are very courteous. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see you again. Some of you are going to Rochester. We'll meet again. The subject is the same. More of the same, sorry.